I want to get to Aristotle. You've written such a fascinating book on called Aristotle's Dialogue with Socrates on the ethic, on the Nicomachean ethics, which is not the usual, I think, way one approaches Aristotle. But let's go back to Plato one more, just for another minute. Um, we haven't mentioned the Republic, which, of course, is the, I suppose, the most famous Platonic dialogue, certainly the one everyone reads as a, yeah. in the Introduction to Political Philosophy course. Um, was that a major concern of yours? I mean, obviously it was, but yeah. anything in particular? I love teaching. I've taught it twice now, I think, for a year course, one semester, one semester. And nobody, I love books eight and nine, the de so-called decline of regimes and the moral psychology behind it. Right. And nobody ever gets that far right. into the things. So I have a, a student writing a dissertation on books eight and nine now, and I said, no, no one has ever done it. There's not, there should be a book, you know, just on the moral psychology. Um, I'm kind of torn in like two or three different directions about this. One thing, I think Plato's cave image, everyone knows Plato's cave image, right? right? Everyone. And I actually think it is unbelievably powerful and explains everything. Lately, like when I listen to Bill Crystal on the news and then I turn on another <laughs> channel. And so, Just to go, another person I, I'm in the thinking, cave. We're all in the cave. And you, it, it is so extreme now, right? You really don't even know the facts of what's going on in the Middle East or right, right. right in these countries. How do you get out of the, it's just unbelievable, because I think Plato would have fully understood and um, feared and appreciated the power of the technology we have. But um, what the, I think with the cave image, so many important things, but with the cave image, why it's so central to everything I do in philosophy and in Plato and Aristotle is on the one hand, you never start with first principles, right? The truth that your mind is, we don't have that. A mind open up and the truth comes to us and we have these assumptions and then we deduce the truth or so. We do start in a context, in a world of opinion and in particular opinions about the noble and the just, right? And uh, are, we stuck, are we stuck in a cave, right? right. And I think one of Plato's interesting observations or implications is every society is a cave. Liberal democracy is as much of a cave as under Sharia is a cave, right? But some caves are a little more open to the light than others. Right. And that's important, of course. Uh, and what it means to get out of the cave. I mean, I think one of the most important things about Plato's cave images, the one point where you really see Socrates there's a guy inside the cave pointing to these objects passing by, and he's asking, what is it? That's Socrates. Socrates asks the what is it question. Mm. What is courage? What is moderation? He's in the cave. Oh, I see. That's good, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's, a corre it's another correction of this image of the philosopher as someone out in the sun just seeing nature without any convention. Now, of course, the cave story, which I think is true but requires interpretation, is that this philosopher has gone out of the cave and returned. Right. The distortion of the cave image that has to be corrected by other dialogues is how much emphasis on compulsion. The philosopher is compelled. There's no eros. The philosopher is compelled to leave the cave. The philosopher is compelled to go back okay. into the cave. That's a particular angle from the Republic. Um, but the idea that we begin in a world of opinion, but we're not trapped by the world of opinion that we're born into. And what a philosopher is, is someone who wants to know the truth and the good of these opinions that we are you know, given as members of society. It you know, seems like one of the most, it's got, it deserves the power it's had on the philosophic imagination, I think. Um, at the end of book seven, there's another image that a lot of people don't pay much attention to, which I found also very useful for so many things. And Socrates there is trying to say what's so dangerous about what he calls dialectics at that point. Uh -huh. And he says, and he's thinking of the Oedipus story, which is, that's another issue, how it's running through the whole Republic. But he says, it's as if you, were an you have an adopted child who has complete trust in the adoptive parents who have raised him his whole life. He trusts them. And then someone comes and tells him, those are not your natural parents. Those are your conventional parents or your adoptive. Those are not your natural parents. And then you want to know, well, who are my natural parents? And he doesn't know. That's a very dangerous situation. You've pulled out the rug from under his trust, mm -hmm. right? 
and shaken him up in his beliefs, but you don't have a substitute true answer to just transmit. And that's his image for dialectics. Dialectics, uh, you know, is, is dangerous. Is dangerous. And I think, you know, a theme that we're all familiar with about the conflict or perhaps impossible harmonizing of the philosopher in the city, that image to me says that very nicely. That uh, the danger, you know, of the questioning of these trusted opinions. And yet, if there is a desire for truth. Right. You know, um, is yeah. there a way to make it less dangerous, or? I mean, I think that P Plato certainly thought very hard about the art of writing right. as the way to do that. And in a way, uh, this is something I think one can learn from, especially from Al-Farabi, and we don't want to get off on that for the mm -hmm. moment, but that the way of Socrates is a, more dangerous than the way of Plato. Like, the actual direct, you know. Encounter. Encounter and challenge to your fellow citizens. that the Writing is a very is a you know very useful tool. You can do certain things through the art of writing that, in a way, of course, are more universal too. But um, the other thing that I think is really important to me and that has guided a lot of my thinking about so many things, including the world around us, which is why I love Plato. He does guide you to think about everything happening around you. Is the psychology of the Republic which is in before you get an analysis of the soul. And on the one hand, again, it's speeches and deeds. The speeches, it's supposed to be the soul maps onto the class structure of the city. Right. Remember that? There's a right. soul structure that maps. And the soul structure is desire, spiritedness, reason, or calculation. Right. And that's supposed to map onto the artisan class, the guardian class, and the philosopher. But Many, many things which we won't go into at the moment, but please read the book for yes, the um, are It's fascinating the way he undercuts that and shows you how Eros works and how Thumos works. These, so to vastly oversimplify, I think that you could say Plato does have two fundamental psychological principles, Eros and Thumos, or desire and spiritedness. And he's always everywhere exploring how those, why those are irreducible to one another, why you have to postulate those two, why we're not just pure reason, of course, but what a role they play in, in, in thinking, in all of human action, in society, uh, how different natures are determined by these, you know, psychological. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's another thing to go back for a minute to, I learned from Bernardetti and Strauss. Bernardetti attributes it to Strauss. I don't know if it's right or not, but uh, he says somewhere, I think in that same Plato essay, that Strauss's way, Plato's psychology was the way to the ideas. That's worth thinking about a lot. That's not, you know, that's got a lot to it to think through. But it feels, it's, I think, quite right that you have the beings and soul. <laughs> and that's why everything is dialogic, because you're dealing with human souls and different natures. But the psychology, so you could put it, here's another vast simplification, but I think it helps as a schema. Eros is directed to the beautiful. I, the Greek word is the kalon, mm -hmm. and I'm in a uh, fight with a lot of my friends about this. The more typical translation is the noble. Right. And for many, many reasons, I always insist on the beautiful. I think the noble is the beautiful in a moral political context. Mm -hmm. But the beautiful is a broader. So anyway, you have eros for the beautiful, and th spiritedness is directed toward the just. Mm -hmm. And they're not the same. They're not the same. They are fundamental. Uh, they are, are they complementary or contradict? That's you know, a lot of questions to raise there. And they stand in some relation to the good. In a way, you've got all, I think, Platonic Aristotelian philosophy standing on one foot, if you say right, that. Right. There, there's so much packed in there that you know shows up in different forms in different places. Well, that's and, great. And when you look around the world, it is very helpful.